So we prepared a little presentation that includes a little intro to each of us. So we'll share that now. And I will kick it off. Okay, so welcome to our PR Basics uh, presentation. Uh, we do public relations and it's kind of actually a really big deal. <laughs> uh, we're gonna go ahead and introduce ourselves. I'll kick it off. Uh, my name is Abigail. I'm an account director here at Rebellious and I've been here for almost two years. My pronouns are she, her, and I live in Anaheim, California. And I'll pass it over to Blake. Yeah, so I'm Blake. I'm an account manager with Rebellious PR team. I've been with the company for about, I think going on like eight months, seven months, eight months. Um, and I live between uh, Oakland uh, and uh, Orange County and I go by he, him. And I'll pass it to uh, Rachel. Hey guys, um, my name is Rachel. Rachel. I am the president of Rebellious, um, so I oversee all of our staff and accounts, and I also um, have worked with the Grid 110 account since day one. Um, I also know founders who went through the program uh, even prior to working uh, with them at Rebellious, so um, I absolutely love this organization and everything that they do for the community here in LA. Um, yeah, and excited to meet you guys. The the cohorts are always uh, some of the, the coolest businesses that we meet doing what we do. Uh, Flo. Hi, my name is Flo or Floricel. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, Aya. Um, I'm an account specialist here at Rebellious. I've been here for now almost eight months as well. I'm super excited to be doing this workshop with you guys. I love what you guys are doing and this is about to be fun, so. <laughs> Yeah, happy go. All righty. All right, let's kick it off. Okay, so what is PR? PR is public relations and it's the maintenance of a favorable public image by a company or other organization. Um, in other words, public relations professionals manage our, we manage our client's brand or image in the public eye. Um, it's the practice, well, I shortened that in the second one here, but um, some of the, sometimes public relations and publicity, I'm gonna admit someone, I had that access, so I just did it. Um, public relations and publicity sometimes, or always differ in that PR is controlled internally and publicity is not controlled or contributed, and it's also contributed by external parties. So some of the things that we do as public relations experts is brand representation, communication uh, to the public at large, such as announcements, grand opening announcements, new product launches and things of that nature. Um, we manage the visibility and exposure via publications of different kinds, um, like business publications, lifestyle, food and bev, specific to, to the brand that, or client that we work with. Um, we do brand building, industry participation and leadership, uh, like thought leadership, um, awards and events. Um, it's also an avenue to inform the media about your product, service, and company, um, and how your story, we manage how your story is communicated by others. And perfect. So PR, do you have to do it? No, but it's a great idea. Um, public relations can have an incredible impact on your business, but as with all things, good things take time. Um, for every brand you see on the cover of Fast Company or featured on Good Morning America, there's a team behind, a PR team behind it that's been hard at work for months, um, sometimes even up to a year to make that um, story run on any of these publications. How it can help you, um, it draws interest from potential customers. It doesn't always correlate to sales, 
Um, it's more of brand awareness and it draws interest from, it can draw interest from potential investors if you're in the right places. Um, it can contribute to your marketing funnel by diversifying touch points that might resonate with different audiences. For example, articles versus product roundups or gift guides. Um, gift guides typically run during the holiday seasons um, and throughout the, throughout the year for different holidays. Um, how important is it? So we on our side believe that it's extremely important. Um, if, if you're, especially if you're trying to build visibility and searchability um, to get the best results from your efforts or our efforts, um, look at public relations as an integral part of your business strategy and not a quick way um, to make your brand famous or a backup plan when something goes wrong. Um, when you understand the true function of public relations and can commit to the long, long game, you can um, you set up your business for success at the end of the day. Um, so the basics of what we do, just some of, we touched a little bit about this, of some of these in my last, my last slide, um, but we do manage the brand story and key messages. We help develop a media, or we develop the media strategy for those key messages. Um, we handle the press releases and company announcements, media and press kits. Uh, we conduct all of the media, media relations and we maintain relationships with media, media and journalists. All righty, and a little bit more about what PR is. Um, so the traditional media on the public relations side is just press, overall press print, digital, broadcast, podcast, uh, magazines, journals, blogs, TV, and um, all, everything on that nature. Um, marketing and advertising is sometimes confused or look, it's kind of funneled in the same um, scope, but PR is not exactly marketing. Like I said, it gets confused a lot, but PR plays a distinct role in both marketing and advertising because Anything concerning the image of the brand falls on the PR realm. Um, social media is another um, scope of PR. Um, so again, managing your presence in the public eye. So social media platforms like LinkedIn, Instagram, although even the new ones. Um, and then social media engagement. Peer at Rebellious PR, we also handle influencer relations to target specific communities that are related to your product, service, or brand. Um, can I just add something on the advertising? Yeah. Marketing. Um, so uh, just an additional point on the, the confusion um, between the two is uh, like your marketing and advertising funnels that traditionally people will talk about things like KPIs and ROI and um, CPAs, cost per acquisition, cost per click, things like that, um, if you're trying to build your customer base. So that all can be measured directly through your marketing and advertising channels in that you are quantifying that based on the actual engagement with this thing that you've paid to place, right? Like you've paid for an ad to be placed in your newsfeed, uh, to be placed in, in your target demographics newsfeed, whether that's on Facebook or Instagram mm -hmm. um, or TikTok or Google AdWords. And uh, the, so you can measure the effectiveness of that. PR's role in that, um, in saying that uh, PR is uh, everything concern, concerning the image of the brand, essentially like we are the, the people to make sure that the, the feeling that somebody gets when they engage with the brand is positive, or uh, if they, see something out on the internet about the brand, they're building a positive association with you or with the brand, um, even if they haven't yet engaged. So it's a little bit harder to measure because a sentiment isn't something that can be measured by a click. Um, but, you know, if you're scanning through the news, if you're scanning a publication, if you're flipping through a magazine, you're, um, you know, flipping through social media, um, you're not going to engage with every single uh, thing that interests you, but you might bookmark it for later, or you might just mentally make a note or log something in your brain as like, oh, that looks nice. And then later when it comes up again, 
and maybe it takes two or three times for that ad to actually be effective, you've built a positive association with it because of partially because of the uh, positive sentiment and um, brand message that the PR team has worked with um, alongside the marketing. So, um, so they're, you know, they're all sort of in the same arena, but I think that one of the things that people get really confused by is the measurement of PR. And it is a really hard thing to measure because feelings are hard to measure. Yeah, now so, pass it over to Blake for yeah. developing your story. Um, so we're going to talk about developing your story. Um, what is your story? So figuring out figuring out your messaging and what you bring to the table is crucial to all aspects of the story you tell, whether it be through PR, marketing, or social media. This is where the magic comes from. Go to the next slide. Yep. Um, so you want to ask a lot of questions about your identity. Um, which hopefully you're already doing that in a variety of different ways um, for your business strategy and development. So what are your key differentiators? Why are they important? Why is it timely? Timeliness is very important. It's a that big deal. Why is our advantage and what stories can we be telling? What is my expertise? Can or should my expertise or experience be part of the brand's identity? Uh, you also wanna do your research. So who are your competitors? What kind of PR and marketing are they doing? Where are they being written about? What type of stories are being written about them? Uh, what variety of press do they have? So whenever you're looking into your competitors, it's really important to do this because the, the way that people do PR and the way that people do any kind of social media marketing is continuously changing. So you want to try to stay above the curve. Um, you don't want to be doing stuff that was done like a year or two years ago, because then your competitors are just taking everything from you. So you want to make sure that everything you're doing is timely um, and that you are doing the due diligence and researching what your competitors are doing. Next slide. Uh, media strategy and key elements. So developing a media strategy, uh, press releases, company announcements, this is what most people think of when they think about PR. Uh, your big announcement, company press releases should be key pillars in your media strategy, but that's only the beginning. So like press releases and the announcements is a very small portion of what PR actually does. Um, it's, I would say, yeah, it's just very seldom. So there's a lot that goes with it, but it's very important to make sure that you spend quality time on those things, the press release and the announcement, because it needs to be really, really, I wouldn't say perfect, but it has to be really good. Uh, identity, identity, identify media entry points that could result in positive visibility. So any articles, product roundups, gift guides, podcasts, thought leadership, panels, and events. And again, these fall into that whole thing with timeliness. So you wanna make sure that you are doing things well in advance. So like the, the product roundup or the gift guides, if you're looking to do something for Christmas, you need to be preparing for that months and months and months in advance of that, that way that you are dropping seeds and you're getting out there um, ahead of time. Um, hone in on with the stories you've developed to determine where they should be targeted. Uh, human interest pieces. So like the founder story, community story, customer story, um, dream up some headlines and bylines, unique products or company offerings, company news, products and offerings that can be tied to a culturally relevant theme, news cycle, topic, holiday event, or culturally significant observance. Again, timeliness. Um, you want to make sure that you're doing those human interest pieces because that is really what gets people involved with the product or a company. Um, otherwise, you're just missing out on the entire point of doing your PR. And that's what it's for. Uh, you want to understand the difference between a paid versus organic um, earned media strategy. And so if anybody has questions about like the difference between paid and organic, you can definitely let us know and we'll go over that in more detail. And I'm going to pass it to Rachel. Okay. Um, so uh, a question that we got a couple times in the FAQs and a question that I get all the time from clients is about, um, you know, what, how to create a media kit or a press kit. 
Um, there's no right answer. Um, there's a variety of formats that work perfectly fine for the media. Um, I think the two most successful formats are either creating a PDF packet that has everything about the brand. It's almost like a, a lookbook and an about us that gets shared with the media. Um, the other version that um, a lot of my product-based clients end up utilizing more frequently is uh, a shared Google folder or Dropbox folder um, because of the fact that they are sharing product images that often have to be white seamless uh, or transparent PM PNGs. Uh, in order to be included in uh, product roundups or uh, given to designers of an article to make those like, you know, those jazzy photoshopped heading photos where they have 10 different products kind of collaged onto it. Um, and you can't really pull that from a PDF unless it's a PDF that can be broken up in Illustrator and Photoshop. And then if it's not the right resolution, you have to, it's, our job with the press kit is to make the publication's life as easy as possible and to um and the easier we are to work with on behalf of the brands the easier it is for us to give them the materials the the more likely they are to include us um we've definitely had situations where um the we will get passed over because it was too hard to get materials from the client or they were just uh too low quality and they'll just they'll use somebody else if we don't like spoon feed something very easily to them um so the common assets uh often needed whether this is in a pdf format or uh in a folder um, whatever your most recent press release or news announcement is, so if this is your company launch, you want to include that. If it's your most recent product uh, release, you want to include that. Um, basically, just to sort of uh, give them something to read with background about your company um, and include it on your press release should always be a boilerplate about the company. So they should get an idea from that press release of um, what you're releasing, where you've been, and who you are overall just in that one page document. Um, there should be product images. Um, you can include an info sheet or just basic information about the company that could be, um, you know, founding story. Uh, that could be, uh, you know, uh, the, the history of your company, depending on how old of a company you are or the genesis of it. Um, bios about the founders um, or uh, interesting spokespeople or C-level executives that are um, notable from the human interest angle, um, and then headshots of the people who are uh, who really matter for the brand. Um, so thinking about going back to what um, Blake was talking about with um, thinking about your, uh, your developing your identity, um, you want to, th the, the difference there um, between talking about the company and the product's value proposition is like, are, are you thinking about the product itself? And that is the thing that you're leaning on to attract people to it. Or are you uh, telling people why they should care about the company and the products based on who the company is like via the founder? Um, a great example of this is the founder of Spanx. Um, she not only uh, has the product built a reputation because of uh, it being a first of its kind, a first to market in this space, it really changed the game at a time when everybody was wearing pantyhose, but also her founding story uh, was something really special from a human interest perspective. She started the brand with $5,000. She, you know, cut up pantyhose herself. She had all of these like photographs of her early product development iteration phases. Um, so over time, the, not only was the product great, but they got some extra PR legwork in the fact that her story and her like entrepreneurial like journey was a point of interest. Um, sorry, sending, uh, looking at the chat. Uh, yeah, so a, a deck format is, uh, yeah, it can be a PDF, it can be a Canva link, right? Like, uh, you know, yes, that's, that. it can be that. Um, my recommendation again is uh, if your company is a service, um, then a deck is appropriate. If it's a product where you have like a whole suite of products, um, let's say it's a clothing line, a skincare line, um, a, a, a food company where you have a handful of different products, 
um, you may want to consider doing it as a Dropbox folder or a Google Drive folder that is shareable because of the amount of photos and uh, images that you'll want to be sharing with the media. Um, but if it's a service, a deck is super appropriate. Uh, but again, it's it's discretionary. It really uh, varies based on uh, preference for not only the writer, but also what the publication is going to need. And you can always uh, attach a press kit and then later follow up if they're interested with your individual images attached or follow up with a download link for them to have access to the assets that they need to bring your coverage to life. Um, okay, so once you've um, identified like your story and your media strategy and created your press list, then you get into the trenches of doing the actual media relations. And this is where the fun really begins, right? Like you've laid the foundation for the house and now you actually have to start like decorating and building, building the rooms out. So um, the most important thing that you're going to want to start with is developing your press list. Um, this is the list of people in the media that you want to write about you and that you think you have a reasonably good chance of attracting interest from. Um, I, I believe that like intentional identification of the the right media is much more valuable than having like a list of a thousand people that you mass blast your press release or info out to um, because you could annoy a whole lot of people um, and also there's a good chance that 90 percent of the people on that list are not going to uh, it's not going to be their beat it's not the type of coverage that they write um, even if it is in their beats they may not let's say it's a uh, a finance reporter and you have a fintech company, um, just because they're a finance reporter doesn't necessarily mean that they cover fintech startups. So um, you'll want to do research on um, what it is that they do in order to identify um, if this person is appropriate to be on your media list for outreach or not. Um, when you're building your list, I highly recommend having a spreadsheet to keep track of name, email, um, their beat. Uh, usually if you click on the name, uh, and the author's byline in an article, it'll take you to um, on the publication, the page that links all the other articles that they've written. And it'll also have like two sentences about who they are, maybe a link to their Twitter and what they typically cover. Um, keep track of that information. And sometimes what we will do is um, we'll include in our uh, media list building phase, the link to the article that uh, that caused us to find this writer, um, whether it was a keyword, a specific news topic that they wrote on, like what was it that drew us to them? And then work backwards from there to identify if this writer is appropriate for us to um, introduce our clients to or uh, you know, request that we introduce them. Um, there's a variety of different kinds of writers. They serve different functions um, at publications. There are editors and editors do write also. Um, they're not just uh, the, the yes or no guy uh, who green lights or um, edits articles. They do tend to write. Um, there are staff writers, there are reporters, there are contributors and, and freelancers, and they all serve slightly different functions, especially in the era of shrinking newsrooms that we are in. So a lot of newsrooms are shrinking their staff writers and staff editors, um, and instead farming a lot of the work out to freelancers and contributors who the staff writers either support or the editors work with to place the uh, editorial content and then they, you know, they pay them as a freelancer or a contractor. Um, but be sure to, to look up, um, you know, who, who it is that you're pitching so that you are pitching them appropriately or that you're planning to do thoughtful outreach. Um, it, you know, they don't love being spammed because they're humans behind those email addresses. Um, and then think about what it is that you are going to be asking for in your media relations process. Like, like truly identify what the goal is with conducting media relations. Like, what are you building the relationship for? Um, 
the answer is not just so that I get press, right? Like the, like continue to like pull the thread on what that conversation is. Like what kind of press, what are you hoping to get out of it? Why would press from that outlet be important? It's going to give you a better idea of what you're pitching and how you're pitching it to the people that you're pitching to. Um, if you're going for lifestyle publications, then I would pull at that thread and say, okay, so what you want, theoretically, if, you know, if I'm understanding why you're going to lifestyle publications is because you want to attract consumers and you want to make consumers, uh, interested in your brand or, um, engage with your brand in some fashion, whether that's awareness or direct product purchases via a product roundup. And then you probably want uh, the third party validation of being in those publications. And you probably also want the competitor validation of existing in the same product roundup as other people in that same category of products. So there's a variety of goals there that you're trying to hit if you are a product company that is going after uh, consumer and lifestyle publications. That's a different media effort than if that same consumer product company is trying to go after publications that their investors are going to read. There's not really going to be a lot of product roundups in business publications. Occasionally there are, um, but they usually show up more in the form of reviews or they are specifically because the, you know, the publications have to do a little bit of SEO boosting, um, and, it, and different kinds of content for engagement. But, um, you know, there's a, there's a, there are, are publications that do tons of product roundups or tons of product reviews, something like Good Housekeeping, Allure, um, Refinery29, but then they also will do this other long form article style content um, that are features either on what's trending in the media uh, or they will do content on, um, you know, celebrities or, uh, you know, news or long form features of um, interesting people. And that sort of changes all the time. But, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to get a cover story or a full feature in, in a glossy magazine like that. Um, but if you're going after business publications, you might have the goal of, you um, being associated with an industry that is seeing a lot of growth so that you attract investors, right? Like, you know, this market is projected to be worth X number of billions of dollars in the next five years. And so you want to position yourself at the center of that. And maybe that's by getting quoted in an article about that industry um, so that an investor sees that and is like, huh, I wonder who that company is, or I wonder who that person is um, in relation to this industry. And they you know, then perhaps they organically discover you that way. Or if you're quoted in there, you can take that link, send it to your would-be investors who are maybe on the fence about um, committing and say like, look, I got quoted in TechCrunch or I got quoted in Bloomberg or Forbes. Um, but never expect that those publications are going to produce your customers. So just make sure that you're really, really clear about what you're asking for and what your goals are so that you aren't wasting your time with, uh, with outreach that isn't going to land for not only the writers, but also for the intent of the goal that you've set. Um, so as I mentioned with the different kinds of publications and knowing what you're reaching out for, there are many different kinds of asks um, for what kind of coverage you're looking for. It can be announcement of a product launch. It can be a product roundup. It could be funding news. So you've secured funding. And what you want to do is you want to land a Forbes story that says that you've landed this funding round and it's a little write up on your company. And then you can put that in your email signature as seen in Forbes. Um, product reviews or evergreen stories. So these are the human interest stories um, that uh, work to support the positive brand building of your, uh, of your company. Um, and then write a really good pitch, um, shoot your shot, uh, you know, try to make it approachable and interesting and timely. Um, follow up, but don't do it to the point where 
um, you know, silent where you know that you've gone past the point where silence means no, and then you end up on somebody's blocked email list. You don't ever want to do that. And now over to Flo. Awesome. Thank you, Rach. Um, so it's really important to maintain relationships, um, especially in PR, because that really depends on if people want to write about you more or not. Um, but it's also really important to stress that these relationships take takes time. So it's impractical to kind of expect um, a pitch to, you know, get interest in the first week or, you know, sometimes it takes months. Um, and then also just having, uh, you know, doing your research. Um, research is so important in public relations. And so you have to, what, well, what we do specifically is we like either follow them on social media, we follow their newsletters, um, we're constantly looking at stories they write, um, just kind of being in the know and, um, you know, just trying to find your way in to have a conversation with them and then bringing a pitch to them and then being like, hey, I see that you're writing this um, and it's something that you're normally right about and that they're more likely to um, write about it. So also another important thing is rem remembering that they are humans <laughs> on the other side of the computer. I feel like a lot of the times you forget that. Um, uh, a tip that someone told me, uh, pretend that, well, not pretend, but like treat it as customer service, you know, like it's great tip. <laughs> um, and then just be helpful and patient. Um, they're busy. They have a bunch of articles they're probably writing or just, I don't know, doing things. Um, but yeah, so sometimes when we do follow-ups, we take maybe a week or two, um, you know, just try not to overwhelm them and don't be demanding. Um, I think they really appreciate that when you even say that in the pitch or in your follow-up, like, hey, I know you might be busy. Just, yeah. <laughs> and then, um, you know, come up with ideas for checking in and dropping interesting nuggets of info to a contact you've made. Um, like I said, this is usually when you'll be doing your research and you see something interesting and then you're like, oh, I know that this journalist or this writer writes about this. This is how I could uh, pitch this angle to them. And then um, social media strategy. Um, this is another part that we do. Um, so, connect with influencers and influential people and know the difference. Um, and then social media platforms, where is your audience? It might not just be Instagram, remember to meet people where they are at. So it could be completely different for um, one client where they probably just wanna do Instagram and TikTok or maybe a more business um, kind of B2B company, you would wanna be on LinkedIn or uh, Twitter. And then also um, sponsor and participate in events, create positive and memorable brand touch points with humans in real life. Um, and then, yeah. Okay. Um, it's time for some Q&A questions. We have a list. We took down the list that you, or the questions that you all sent over um, to Maya. Um, so we can kick it off with that. And then we can, um, any other questions that came about during this presentation, we can um, open the floor to everyone. So save those, um, save those for just a few minutes from now. Uh, let me, Flo, if you can stop sharing, I can share my screen with our, with our, with the other questions. And there we go. Share my screen. Okay, and we'll treat this as like an open floor. So feel free to jump in if anyone has any, if anything else comes about while we, um, while we're in this document. Um, and then Flo, Blake, Rachel, jump in where you think. Okay, so some people, someone said um, they're not sure where to start. 
Um, this presentation, I hope will be helpful. We're gonna link it to everyone so you can look at it at your leisure whenever you're able to or have any random questions that come about. Um, you're also more than welcome to reach out to us. Uh, we share our email. We'll drop it in the chat as well, but um, it's just grid110 at rebelliouspr.com. If there's any little questions that or if you, there's anything that you want to put in our ear or just get a second pair of eyes on, feel free to reach out to us. We're always more than welcome to help. Um, but another thing that's important when not knowing where to start is to research and find a PR agency that aligns with your brand, your values, and the type of product or industry that your um, company is in. Um, this can, for for example, with Rebellious PR, we focus on underrepresented founders, um, people of color, and those types of businesses and people that we help um, or that we work with. Um, but that's not always the case. Uh, maybe if you have, you know, there's, I mean, here we have industries we cover like food and beverage, fintech, B two B, um, serve other services that, um, you know, are just in different scopes. And we also represent people, like we have, we work with the chef um, who's based out of Portland and we do manage her publicity and um, pitch her out as an influencer. So it just depends. Um, but the, I think the most important thing is to find an agency that understands you and can represent you in the way that you would represent yourself. Um, so if there's anything, any questions, about that so far. Um, there is a ton of PR agencies out there and they all range from like small boutique agencies to large corporate agencies. Um, and also you wanna work with someone that can work with your budget. So they, I guess that's where you should start. See what your budget looks like and then research agencies that would, um, that align with that. Also, if there's something really special about your story or your company's mission, um, something that is really a specific kind of storytelling that requires like an understanding of a certain piece, identity piece, be really selective in that process. Um, it, it might not be just about how good a company is in the industry that you're in. It's also about how good they are at understanding what makes you special to stand out in that. Um, I think a perfect example of that is we have a client who is um, in the fashion space, um, but it is a company that is founded by uh, two queer women. And um, the, I, the identity of them is, uh, is parlayed through the, the kinds of clothing that they offer and the kinds of like high-end specialty um, wares that they have. And they worked with a really, like a great, by all rights, a great fashion PR firm, but they, that their chief complaint when they came to us was that they didn't feel like their queer identity was ever captured in the PR efforts. And that was really important to them. And so they really wanted, um, somebody, uh, advocating for them that also understood, that it wasn't um, it wasn't just about being in the right places. It was also about putting uh, putting the right face forward for for them for their identity because it's a really really critical piece um, for for their brand building so that their customers could see themselves in the the founding team and in the um, in the business itself. So. You know, there's a there's a variety of things to weigh when you are shopping for a PR agency. But if it's truly about like I want to be in this industry and I want to be competitive with these companies, um, you know, and and all of all else is equal, then like absolutely, you know, go with the the one that you feel um, has the you know the best stake uh, in the ground for for your budget. But the the emotional piece matters sometimes too. Yeah. Um, okay, and then on to the next question about materials. 
one of the or one of the submissions was was don't know how to create a PR kit, what to include or how to ask. So a PR kit, we talked a little bit about this in our presentation. Um, you'll want to include all the assets that your media or journalist that you're working with would need in order to complete um, the article or whatever it is that they're writing about. Um, the information in that kit should help them understand you, the brand, and get to know exactly what it is that you do. So it, it depends, as Rachel mentioned, it depends on if you have a service or a product, um, but the press release will always be important to have on there. Any photo assets or headshots of the founder, depending on the type of story, um, a one pager um, with just the information, the top information about your product or service. Um, who the spokespeople are, um, and then there's no rule or exact format. It can come in, press kits can come in different ways. Um, it's typically depending on preference, um, but a PDF folder or a PDF document is typically preferred in like the Google Drive or Dropbox. Um, yeah, any questions about that? We hope that's answered that question. And then on the how to ask part, sorry, I opened the floor and then I, uh, on the how to ask part, the journalists will ask for this as they need it. On, on our side, we typically provide it for them as a quick little link in case, like right off the bat, as soon as we start working with them. Um, but it's important to have it before you do outreach. Um, on the, the pricing and time commitment, um, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to range broadly if you work with a, a small agency versus a large agency versus a freelance contractor. Um, I will say that for early stage startups um, or small companies that have smaller budgets, you, could, you might be better off going with a freelancer or an independent contractor um, because they don't also come with, you're, you're paying them for their work and their expertise. Um, work, working with an agency means that you also are, um, you know, you're part of the agency's ecosystem and part of their, um, there's a whole lot of benefits to working with an agency. Like, you know, the, the way that internally we interact with each other across accounts, like if I don't have a contact somewhere, like I can go to the rest of our staff and say like, who's got the best contact at, um, you know, at Cosmo in this, uh, in this department right now, or something like that. So, you know, the contact sharing is a little bit, um, there's lots of benefits to working with an agency, but, um, you know, it is going to be more expensive than a freelancer or an independent contractor. Um, because you're also, there's also a lot more tools that an agency can provide to clients that, that need those measurement tools that, um, a freelancer might, may or may not also come with. So, um, a perfect example of that is, you know, we have, um, a PR database that we work within that gives us access to like every journalist in the world. Um, but it is a very expensive software. So most individual contractors and freelancers do not have a membership to that software platform. Um, we also have things like uh, measurement tools for to show the efficacy and readership of articles. So we may not be able to associate the click-through sales of a specific article placement. But what we can tell you is we can put together a coverage report that says, you know, this is how many people uh, visited the article. This is um, how many social shares it received. This is the average monthly readership for this publication. Um, so you can compare the, um, the average readership versus what your article got. Um, so we have a variety of tools um, that we use. But um, for some of your like meat and potatoes early on things, like some of that stuff might, may or may not be totally necessary. It really is a case by case basis. Um, and I'd have to talk to every single one of you to make the soundest recommendation. Mm -hmm. uh, but budget definitely um, can be the North Star. So boutique agencies, in my experience, range um, anywhere from like, four to $8,000 a month for retainers on the, on the lower end. And then the bigger the agency, um, the, the higher their floor gets for how, um, 
for the brands that they'll take on. So I have a friend at an agency in New York and she uh, was complaining to me that she really wanted to take on a client that um, had a budget of 7K a month, but her boss wouldn't let her bring on any accounts that were under 12K a month. Um, you know, I've, and like, that's just for the size of their agency. That's just what, um, you know, what the expectation was for her as an account director on her portfolio. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's also like a 500 person agency. So it's a different beast. Um, I've definitely, um, we Mm -hmm. have, um, tried to make, uh, not a lot of agencies do this, but we have made an effort to try to make, um, sliding scale, um, resources available to a certain number of companies a year. We can't offer it to every company we work with. Otherwise we wouldn't be able to keep the lights on. Um, but we do, we have offered, um, you know, a few times a year, um, like deeply, deeply reduced retainers, um, to work with companies that go through, uh, an application process with us. Um, and, and we highly vet those, um, you know, to ensure that we can do good work for, for those companies. So, mm-hmm. and then on time frame, um, this is a great question. So it, PR takes time. This is not something where you can like throw a month's budget at it and then be like, oh, my PR team didn't, you know, get me into um, L or, you know, Martha Stewart living, like what the hell? Um, it takes much longer than that because uh, publication lead times are much, much longer than that. Um, a reporter could have an immediate turnaround story because it's breaking news, but more often than not, they are getting us assignments for uh, publishing, if it's digital, two months in advance, maybe three. Um, and if it's print, it's like they're getting assignments for five months in advance. Like, for reference, I was supplying product back in May um, to print publications that were photographing and they were rushing me in May um, for uh, a magazine that literally hit shelves five days ago. They, it hit shelves on August 23rd. Um, and you know it was a fire drill in May to get it to them because of their print deadlines. So it does take time. So for that reason, most PR agencies will um, ask for a minimum of a six month commitment. Um, some you can uh, talk into a three to four month commitment, but in my experience, you really don't start to see results from your PR team doing consistent, thoughtful outreach to the media until about three months in. And that's when you start to see interest. And then if you allow them to continue to do that work, it snowballs from there and you can build um, on that. But, you know, like uh, Blake can tell you, we've had a client uh, that is a really interesting like corner of tech that nobody really talks about. And it's taken about five months for us to start to see um, like really great coverage for them in the publications that they want to be in, you know, Forbes, Bloomberg, um, you know, business and tech centric. Um, and they were really nervous about signing a six month contract. And now they've extended well beyond that because once we were able to build that momentum, um, you know, you can continue to, to, to build the buzz with other writers, right? It's, it's become sort of a snowball effect. Yeah, and whenever you are working with somebody, you want to have like a go a back and forth on what the strategy is or what you want to do because like we were talking about like niche markets. There was another client that we had that the time frame of somebody getting coverage, there is no time frame. The point is that it has to be time that you have to put in the work. And so there was a client that we were at the end of a four month contract with them and they we're like, well, where's the coverage? And they had actually fought on some of the ideas and um, our idea went through and two days before their contract ended, they ended up on a morning talk show in Portland, um, which was really big and was huge for the company. But the whole point is, is that there's not one way to do anything and there is no time frame for receiving coverage. Um, it's a matter of timeliness and also like what's going on in the world. If there's people dying in Ukraine, 
for you know senseless reasons, that's going to saturate the market as far as what is being covered in the news cycle. Mm-hmm. So you have to be able to find those places. Um, great question in the chat about offering uh, per placement pricing. Don't do this. I like I do not recommend this because I have spoken to a number of these agencies just because I'm always curious what it is that they're selling. They so deeply overcharge for this that it's like when I see that, like the sticker shock is insane. I got like a, I got, I was just curious when somebody reached out and they were like, do you want an agency partner? We'll do the placements for you and you just pay us. And then your clients pay you. And we, I was like, send, send me your price sheet. I'm curious what this is. They're charging like $6,000 for like a mention in something like Forbes or Inc. And like, you could do that yourself. You guys like PR, you know, you're, you're paying for, uh, expertise, of course, but also for some of the, for for some of the early mentions that you can get, like you really could do it yourself. It's just that a lot of people, a lot of founders, especially are time poor, um, because you guys wear a ton of hats. And so, you know, in the background, we are advocating for building a solid reputation, but they're going after just getting, you into a publication so that they can send you like a really high invoice. Um, I thought one of them that I saw was like, you know, we'll get you a feature in Fast Company for, you know, $9,000. I, if you're truly going for earned media, then let it be earned media. That's paid media. And I've seen some of the coverage that's come out of those is just really like, it just doesn't feel honest and it doesn't feel good. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't feel as good as taking two months of working with a PR team that like really knows you well and lands like a story that is all about you versus having your name wedged in with a bunch of other companies, um, you know, in an entrepreneur.com article. Yeah, it's, it gets the, those pay to play ones are really expensive. And I just, I ne- I've never seen them go well. And I've never seen anyone be happy with them. Um, I think it also bears worth mentioning that, um, and I, and I say this from a place of like, obviously being defensive of my team and of my industry, but like your PR team is not just your, um, is, is not just your, uh, mouthpiece to the media. That's not the only function of your PR team. Your PR team can do so much more than just that. So if all that you're interested in is getting a piece of media, you can pay for that. You don't Mm -hmm. need to engage with a PR team to do that. You can do advertorial, you can do paid advertising. Um, but a PR team can really help you build a fully robust brand, uh, to like on the internet that is so far beyond just earned media. Like we do things like identifying awards for our clients that, you know, they, they take about a year to process, but like I've landed uh, companies on times best 100 inventions of the year lists. I've landed them in like fast company where they've gotten full print features for being, for winning, you know, fast companies, most innovative companies, you know, those things, Um, you don't think about the value that those bring and you're like, oh, I got to pay my PR team who's going to help me with this award application. Then I got to pay this $300 application fee. But then nine months from now, when you get that like congratulations email and you realize that now you get to put Fast Company's logo on your website and say like, we were named one of Fast Company's most innovative companies. That's like that, the value of that is so much more worth than any like paid placement that you would have gotten because what you're building is this um, customer trust and this uh, reputation and third-party validation for yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, In addition to awards, we, you know, we go for other media um, when we can't, when print and digital are in process, we're also trying to find podcast opportunities so that you are actually out there, you know, talking on shows with established audiences and followings. Um, we are working on, um, messaging that the marketing teams often end up using a lot of the messaging that the PR teams end up developing, or they implement some of our pitch messaging into their upcoming ads, because, you know, we can come up with some clever angles sometimes that really benefit it. Um, we also help with things like 
media training. Like if you, if you've never talked on TV before and we land a broadcast spot for you, like you don't want to tank that. So we do media training and um, we create briefings uh, with different journalists where they may not cover you immediately, but we do a briefing with them and then they know who you are for in the future when they are covering something in that arena. Um, we connect people for strategic partnerships. Um, like Abigail mentioned, we can do influencer relations. Um, you're like you're a good PR team uh, can do a whole, should be like a Swiss army knife that can do a whole lot more than just earned media relations. And um, I'm going to step in a second. I'm going to drop my email in the chat. Um, Rachel and I actually need to uh, leave you guys. We have a client meeting right now. Um, so Abigail and Flo will take over with questions. Thanks, you too. I'm putting mine in the chat as well. Um, okay. Thank you, everyone. Best of luck with all of your PR endeavors. And uh, email me if you have questions. And Blake, email Blake. <laughs> all right, Abby, Flo, we'll leave it to you guys. All righty, bye, you too. Okay, lots of info there, um, but for preparing a press release and how to go about reaching out to someone put PR, but I think they met media. Um, so first thing is first, before you develop any press release, you wanna, we have a, we put together questions that you should consider before send, before working on that. And I'm gonna drop the link here, but Maya will also be sending it in the um, email recap right after this. Um, feel free to download it, um, use it as you need. Um, I don't think you have access to editing on there, but download and pull the questions that, um, that work for you. Um, and then when you start to draft your press release, we have a template that we put together as well um, on how your press release should look and what you should include and what type of quotes to have in there. Um, and then once all that is complete, then that's when you reach out to media and um, there's a strategy for that, but first you need to put together your uh, media list, which we talked about during the presentation. It takes a lot of research, finding the right people, the right contacts that are writing about the topic that you're um, putting out in the world. Um, so just to save time there, take a look at those links and then reach out with any questions. Um, okay, another question. We're not sure how to leverage the media opportunities at our disposal. So the vetting process goes along with the research process as well. Um, research the media opportunities to gain insight and see if it aligns with your brand or audience. We've, we, as PR professionals, come across this a lot. There's blogs and smaller publications that will sometimes express interest in our client, but it doesn't necessarily always relate to what to our client score or KPIs. So we have turned down media opportunities um, that don't that wouldn't. I guess sometimes we don't think it's worth our client's time, and that's where your PR team comes into play. We vet those and we make sure that they're worth your time and that they're gonna meet the KPIs that we set in place and that it'll benefit your brand overall. Um, so just wanna make sure to utilize your time and energy as efficiently as possible. So hope that makes a little bit of sense to um, leveraging the right media opportunities. Um, sometimes you'll have reporters. We've worked with um, Summa Wealth. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, um, but we've had a lot of reporters reach out to them directly. And what they would do is just forward the email along to us. We vet it. If it's worth it, um, then we would move forward. If not, then we'd be like, you know, feel free to, um, like, we're going to pass and this is why. Um, so that's what your PR team does. But you can, um, when they reach out to you, always do your research before. I know it can be exciting for a journalist to reach out to you, but just do your research, see what they're covering, see what they've recently wrote about, or even um, check out their Twitter. That will say a lot about the, the opportunity that's at your disposal. Um, okay, so getting press and media to share you or about your company, getting the attention of publications and getting press. Um, okay. So here's our response. It's important to get in front of the right journalist at the right time. Uh, another thing to consider or to just keep in mind is that journalists move around 
quite frequently, even more so. We noticed since the pandemic, more and more people have turned either to freelancing or they completely changed their beat. So if you're looking at a um, an article that they wrote in 2019 um, or even 2020, they more likely, like there's a 90% chance that they're not writing about the same topics anymore. So just do your research and see if they're currently working at that publication or writing about that topic. Um, and then again, every publication is different and they have a different target audience. Um, for example, one of the publications that we mentioned was like a Forbes or Fast Company compared to Cosmo or Elle. Um, the first step in getting the attention of the public is to do your research, um, not only with the publication, but the journalist, um, and then use this information to make timely and, val and a valid connection. Another thing to consider, we do this a lot as PR professionals, is if you, once you have the interest of that journalist that you're, that maybe they're your ideal journalist that you want to write for you, um, invite them to coffee. Uh, it's always more likely than not. I feel like, again, since the pandemic, it's less likely, but now it's a 50-50 chance. They say no, they say no, or even a Zoom meeting, um, just to like quickly get to know them a little bit, maybe talk to them about your product, or even um, just to to do a like a sampling on via Zoom. Um, and that, that goes for, I guess, like product, uh, product base. Um, compared to service space. Um, and then getting more publicity. That wasn't really a question. I think I think it was just a thought <laughs> that someone dropped in. Um, there's really no magic solution for getting more pub publicity. Publicity like media opportunities can be earned and paid as Rachel was mentioning the advertorials and um, advertising. The goal is to get to use your energy and assets to work towards a timely and relevant target. Um, Blake talked a little bit about this. So if there is uh, something that's happening in the media currently and you're able, for example, Roe versus Wade, we have a couple clients that are in the sexual wellness space and they we were able to get them into conversations about Ro, Roe versus Wade because their founder was super, um, she, uh, she covered, a she talked about a, a lot of those topics and her business was based on those topics. So it was a great opportunity to, to slide her into those conversations with journalists. Um, and then again, it's about building the right connections with the right journalists that write about your industry. And we'll say this a million times, it takes a ton of research. Um, I would say half, more than half of our job requires research, 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 and just, you know, getting right place, right time, right people, right places. Um, okay, uh, next question about building strategy. Strategy is strategy for consistent PR. Um, so we hate to sound salesy, but I think it, it's uh, a matter of hiring and finding the right agency, freelancer, or PR person that you want to work with. Um, to develop your strategy. And again, it's based on the service you're providing, product, or if you're doing brand reputation. Um, next question, grabbing attention when you send a cold email. Um, this is the name of the game for us. We send a ton of emails, a ton of cold emails, and it's more likely um, to work if you've done your research and you get the attention of the right correct writer at the right time. Um, you'll get their attention if you, um, one thing we do is always research what they're currently writing about. And my some of my intros include, hey, I recently, I read your story on uh, Martha Stewart about X, Y, and Z. I'd love for you to consider my client who is has this product or whatever the case is. But um, the best way to get attention is to be relevant. Um, and I just saw a question come up. When pitching editors, writers, is it helpful to share coverage from other outlets you've previously received? Um, okay, so I I go back and forth with this. It depends. Um, typically, no. They don't. I I receive a lot of newsletters from writers and freelancers, and more recently, I've they this question has come up as well in our industry with PR professionals and um, journalists. They don't really like that. They mentioned that, um, 
yes well they've mentioned that if they wanted <laughs> if you want to be in those outlets then reach out to those writers so don't share like oh we were on Forbes they they for the most part could care less um, as long as you are grabbing the attention of them with something that's relevant to them um, I think there is a way you can for sure write a like slide in like I've been I came out on this because of this topic then that can spark a little bit more interest there but it's not like you don't won't want to say hey I've been featured on this this and this and this is why you should cover my story or my brand um, so more likely than not don't don't always throw it out there um Flo said the subject lines are super important. This is one of the most important um, things that we do. We brainstorm subject lines that are relevant and are gonna um, encourage the writer to open our email. So being intriguing and concise, uh, mentioning, say mentioning coverage from the outlets. Yes, thanks Flo. Um, okay. My book is being, is published and I have a press release going out. Okay. I don't, again, I don't think, I don't know if that was a question, um, but great. <laughs> is your media list up to date? It's important to have an updated media list as journalists tend to move around from publication to publication. It's previously mentioned. So just make sure that you have the right journalists that cover your topic. Um, okay. Moving on to building your media list. Finding media outlets to help with your go-to-market strategy, invest the time. That's the biggest thing. We'll say it again and again, research, research, research. Um, the correct outlets for your brand and your topic are what's going to um, bring the most success. Context for our upcoming grand opening. Same as above. Um, typically with grand openings, it's important to get um, local writers and invite them to your grand opening. Um, writers love coming to these type of events. I would even offer what we do, we recommend our clients do is have a media hour. Um, so if you have 10 or even 15 journalists and influencers, depending on your event, um, that are invited and are planning to attend, I would have a separate hour or even like 30 to 40 minute block where it's dedicated just for them and make yourself available to answer any questions that they have and just go up and introduce yourself as the founder or the spokesperson of the company or brand. Um, grand openings are my favorite things to do. Um, writer, this is the best time to build those connections with local writers in your geographical location. Um, okay, finding finding the right PR agency for your brand. Who is the best PR agency in startup meets fashion? Well, like we mentioned earlier, it depends on uh, a lot of things, your budget, and um, we can, there's so many agencies out there that specialize in specific industries, just like us and like other industries that are doing similar things as us. Um, it's just important to do your research. Again, like we mentioned, budget ranges can range from like 4k to 30k a month and it's really just about finding the right person or the right agency at the that aligns with your with your brand um other things to consider as we oh, we put here 10k to 100k um which i recently talked to a friend in at another agency and they're they have a, a couple clients that pay in the 100k range uh monthly but those are huge corporations that are like the Toyotas of the world and um all those and then the other thing to consider is your goals sales versus awareness and building buzz they're completely different um we typically on the sales side we work with the marketing and advertising departments with some of our clients alongside so we we have we sometimes even have our own Slack channel where they're all involved and we're involved. Um, it's just a huge, I guess it's like one of those triangles, right? Where or circles where um, you have your marketing, advertising, and PR department. We all all in the same scope, but we all do different things. Um, and then working with influencers and marketing on a working with an influencer marketing agency. Those are also available. Um, so if you have a product-based company um, and you want to work with influencers, 
this has grown so much in the last like five years. Um, influencers, I know we hate to be um, to be caught in their trap and buy the things that they um, show on their Instagram. I am guilty. I always buy all the random little things. But there are um, there's also an influencer strategy that you can develop for this. Typically, um, influencers will you'll want to do your research just like journalists. We treat them as journalists as well. Um, so we reach out to them, see if they're interested in. Well, first make sure that they align with the brand that they cover or you know share products or topics that we're talking about or that our brand, our client is about and then we reach out to them spark their interest see if there's an opportunity for um there's been a lot of times i've worked with a lot of unpaid influencers where they are open to doing like a sampling or um getting free product in exchange for a post um more typically with smaller influencers they're the ones that are open to it because they're building they're building their own brand and they're building their um their roster so um if you want to work with influencers start with the small ones and then build your way up um influencers prices can range from anywhere from like 50 bucks to five thousand dollars um and then including your including the product that you send them so lots of things when you when it comes to journalists and influencers, things are a little bit different. And then typically, if you work with a paid influencer, they will have a contract, or you'll have to provide them a contract just to ensure that you're going to pay them and that they're going to, you know, also give you what they um, offered in exchange for payment. Um, so that wraps up the questions that were initially sent over. Is there anything? else that comes to mind I know we're right at time but we can take another couple minutes if anyone has any questions <laughs>